So yeah, basically, uh, the, 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 the performance part that will happen after is a kind of magnetic device that produce a very strong electrical arc and produce a very strong magnetic field, uh, which is basically something you could find as a kind of taser, taser, something that you use to, to defend yourself. So it can, like this version right now, it's still in process and it's, it's more about musical instruments, but um, it will be more and more also about the disturbance it can do with, um, with uh, new technological devices, such as smartphones or computers or everything that uh, has an electronic chip inside, because the magnetic field can disturb a lot of the, the small devices we use right now. Um, but this is for the end. Uh, maybe first I will react to the LRAD uh, talks we had just before with an ancient project we, I did like a few years ago. It was... Um, I need to share the Wi-Fi. Seems to be okay. Uh, it was in, in, um, in relation with the book which called Sonic Warfare. It uh, was, I think, edited in 2009, and it was about sonic weapons use and LRAD, and also the the use of the, like in Guantanamo where they were using like uh, heavy metal music to to arm the um, the prisoners, and all the uh, all the use of the sound that could be used as a weapon, and so. I decided to, to with, with a friend, we decided to, to kind of react to it and to build a kind of uh, DIY self-defense uh, sonic weapon, which could look like this, if it works, yes. Uh, maybe this is more clear. So those are the tries. So we, su we success to a, a, a length of 37 meters, so the police can be quite far, and you, you can you can touch them at 37 meters away. So. Uh, yeah, it was an artistic project. Huh? Uh, the ba basically, the idea was to have a speaker flying in the sky, but it became a very nice weapon. And eventually, you can also like uh, collect some. Uh, no, not this one. This one. You can maybe start to collect your own uh, projectile projectiles for uh, the next demonstration. Um, but more seriously, I mean, that was, uh, that was also to point 
um, the finger on, on something that was, I think, very important, is that the political aspect of using sound. And uh, most of my work is about uh, this in the, in the background, not always uh, funny like this, and not always as a first uh, uh, page, but it always has a kind of political effect or aspect. And uh, there is one project also which is very connected to, to the use of sound, which we, 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 it's not that we forget about, it's just that we are so used to it that we don't think so much about, is the use of the microphone, which basically is a very uh, strong um, weapon of power for the one who speaks in it and the one who takes the speak. And uh, we have to remember that most of the, the evolution of amplification and, and the technology of uh, taking the sound was done for um, the, basically the masters, uh, how to say, like the, the dictators, basically. And most of the evolution happened during the 30s with Hitler, uh, because he was one of the first to, to do speeches in stadiums. And they had to develop a lot of material for the masses to hear what he has to, to say, all the shit he was throwing. But um, so it's something that um, for me was always keeping this in mind that when you use a microphone, it's, it's, it has this history and this background. The same for being on a stage, it's, it's, it has the same, um, um, I don't know. It's not that going on stage you become a dictator, it's just that you use the same tool as a dictator. It's just to remember this. And uh, so there was a series of performance called Propaganda, which is, sorry, it's kind of slow. which is a very, very, very simple ID. So yeah, I was kind of uh, just checking how much it can uh, get. Uh, but yeah, and, and uh, to, 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 to also maybe give some other overview, and uh, I was focused a lot on, on uh, I focused a lot on, on, 
on um, audio media and the history of media and, and what was the meaning of using medias and, and to record things and to to produce the material to to keep the the memory of of uh, sound and listening and when you go into the history of the very first i will i will do it very very short the 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 sound history but there is something interesting to 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 understand from it is that the the, the very very first experiment uh was done during uh, was done in um, 1980 no 1860 uh And it was to, tr to try to record sound without the ones to 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 play it back. It was just to to ones to to grab the the shape of the sound in with the thoughts that you could you could write the words just by by uh, basically writing the sound you can hear. And um, I'm sorry, I forgot his name. With the stress of the talk, I'm okay. Sorry, I, I don't even wrote his name. But the inventor, the phonograph, it was an incredible, crazy machine which was a part of a human skull uh, containing the inner ear, and which is connected with a needle to write the sound. So this, what you see here, is a part of a human skull. And the ear has been replaced by a horn to talk in it. And the small needle you see from here is connected to the, uh, to the hammers in the, in the inner ear. And so they were using the, 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 the kind of biological mechanics to write the sound. Uh, and and it, it works very well. You can find many of the those recordings. They, they are just graphicals, and lately they they could have uh, scanned it and and reproduced the sound that was recording on it. And it's uh, mostly voices and some small songs uh, sung into the the ears of a dead person. Uh, And um, sorry, I'm a bit lost. I think we can get very well the function of it. Yeah, voilà. So it's very clear. Like the the patent is very uh, simple and very clear. So that was the way to write the sound at first, and then the whole industry started to to find this very interesting and develop like first uh, uh, cylinders to to record the sound on it. But it was taking a lot of places, so um, Berliner came and invented the flat records, which we know very well as a gramophone, which become the vinyl. And the vinyl, it's interesting because there's nothing, you, you don't need any, I mean, all those techniques of uh, writing with a stylus and, and reading with a stylus, you don't need electricity, you just need mechanic. You just need uh, something that is turning or moving and something that is vibrating because the technique is very simple. Um, <sighs> Uh, yeah, sorry, we won't have time to talk about this. Uh, so the technique is very simple. It's a groove which is uh, cutted into the material, and uh, the needle that gonna touch the that gonna enter into the groove gonna vibrate, and then the sound will get reproduced. So you have a very physical um, uh, relation between the, the stylus and the material. It's even penetrate the surface to vibrate. And when you go further in the history, so you can see here the microscope, it's very beautiful, it looks like a, like a canyon. 
Uh, and when you go further in this history, uh, yeah, sorry, I wanted to, to, because there is an experiment to do if uh, the one who has nice nails, you can cut them, I recommend the hedge or the pointed, and you place your finger into the groove of a vinyl, you will feel the sound from your finger. I mean, I'm not joking, huh? make a try, you have to really shape it. I think the edge is the best with more uh, vibrance, vi vibrations. Uh, so then the next uh, invention in sound recording was basically the tape, so not this was during the 60s, first it was just um, uh, magnetic tapes without the, the, the plastic case. Uh, and uh, the cassette is interesting because it's still physic, like the, the the sound is uh, written magnetically on the tape, but it's very physical, it's analogic. And uh, you, you see the sound here re written on, a, on the surface of the, the metal of the, the tape. And uh, the way to play it back, you have the head that is not anymore entering the surface. It doesn't need to vibrate physically. It vibrates electrically. So the, the, the head that you see just here, is touching the, the magnetic strip, which looks like this, and then it vibrates electrically to, 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 to play back the sound. And then, uh, this is like microscopic, this is the technique, we go, I just go very quick in it. Then the next uh, invention was the CD, and the CD is interesting because we don't touch anymore the surface, we don't penetrating it, we just use the optical technique to read it. So it's like if we don't even, like we are starting to fly over the, the surface of the, of the media. And then, so this is how it's written on a, on a CD. Uh, this is a di digital written. And uh, you don't need you, 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 you need electricity to, to play back sounds from a CD, but you also need a lot of interfaces that is uh, um, basically uh, decoding the, the, the digitals that is written in the CD. So it's not anymore, uh, uh, there's no more vibration, not even electrical. It's, it's a whole way of encryption and de disencryption, decoding of... Um, of uh, the information, uh, and it's getting more and more small with the DVD and then the Blu-ray, and then it start to totally get even more difficult. It it, it become difficult to to look at it with the hard drives that are in in the computers. A hard drive look like this, uh, and even more like this. The information is still written on the surface. But it's so, so, so tiny that uh, even the, the electronic microscope, I think maybe there is one image. But there was one thing that interested me in the research with hard drive is that it looks exactly the same as this, basically. I mean, honestly, and there is a disc, an arm, and a reading head. So the, the, the te technology didn't evolve that much, it's just get more small. And the information gets also much, much more small, so you can store um, an amazing amount of, uh, of data on, uh, on hard drive. Uh, it looks like this on the, the microscope, the surface, and even like this. But the, the, you, you see the, the needle, it's not touching at all the surface, otherwise it would scratch it. So it's flying over and getting the magnetic information of the, of the record. And then after that, uh, it's kind of new technology. We use SSD um, hard drives to store uh, information. And there is nothing any more mechanical or, or, or even more vibrating or whatever. It's just like electrical charges that are stored into uh, microchips that looks like this at the microscope and even more like this. And so they are basically like uh, storing positive and negative charges that makes the, the digits becoming one or zero. It's sorry to be so boring. 
but it's how it is now. It's much less sexy than a vinyl, but uh, this is how the MP3 are, are played right now uh, from SSD uh, memory. And so that was the very short, very quick overview on the history, but what was very shocking for me it was the distance we took from the material and the more and more interfaces that were um, um, coming between the information and the access of the information. Because as I, as I shown you with the, just uh, your, your nail shaped as a needle, you can read a vinyl, try to do it with your computer, I'm not sure it's gonna work. And there is really something I understood is that the, the, the more we go in, in evolution and the more we, we get distant from the, um, the material. And uh, there was this, uh, this, this uh, term used during the early 2000s that was, they were talking about dematerialization. I guess you heard about this. So it was dematerialization of music, dematerialization of, uh, of um, movie, um, how do we call it, the roles. I mean, everything, like the paper was dematerialized and it was this, this very fancy name, which I discovered is totally a fake, it's a lie. It's not a dematerialization, it's a delocalization of material or of memory into other material. Because we never talk about the quantity of material we need to produce those kind of miniature um, um, devices, such as to, to make, you can do a lot of research, you will find very easy. To build a computer, you will need at least between two and three hundred uh, kilograms of stones or, or from mine that is taken from a mine and then you're gonna choose the rare earth from the stones to make those very, uh, very um, developed chips that are in the computer. And it's between two and three thousand liter of water that are used for the process of um, of uh, cleaning. And uh, and uh, so we are basically a computer of two kilograms used uh, 3,250 kilo of material to be built. So it's more kind of a compression of material that we are, like a cell phone is maybe uh, yeah, a few hundred kilos of, of material at first, then, to, then finished in few grams in the pocket. But this is something we really have to, to not forget. Uh, I think I had the number. I think it's 900 kilowatts per hour to, to, to produce a computer. So if you want to do it, if you compress the time in one hour, you need 900 kilowatts of energy to build a machine such as a, a computer. Yeah, it was more about, uh, I think it's, it's really something I want to, to, to spread into the minds that there is no dematerialization, there is delocalization. And when we talk about clo clouds or, uh, or uh, immaterial uh, memory, I mean, we are talking about data centers that are th millions of tons of concrete that are using a, an, an amazingly uh, uh, amount of energy to, to keep cold, to keep the... Oh, I killed it. To keep the memory alive. Uh, so why I was talking about this is that because in my work I was always putting the hands into the, the all the, the, the different uh, way of uh, playing back the sound. So when I first I used I, I was hacking a lot of um, uh, turntables that we call the turntablism. Uh, movement during early 2000. Then I started to put my hands into uh, CD players and disturbance in CD players and then in hard drives. That I did uh, many uh, performances taking the hands into hard drives and using it as a kind of synthesizer instrument. But when the SSD uh, arrived, I was kind of uh, at a dead end because there was no more mechanics. I didn't know how to to to, to disturb what, what was going on, what, or to even like talk about what was going on. 
And so there is one way of uh, disturbing uh, or getting access to to, um, to such a small uh, technology like this is the magnetic field and magnet magnetic disturbance. So that's how I came to develop this instrument, which I will show you. I hope I was not too long. I didn't get the time. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, there was one video I wanted to show, but no, no, no problem. Okay. And uh, if you can close the the light, because the, uh, I I don't need any lights to. Thank you. <laughs> 